Are we on? Good morning. Uh, I'd like to welcome everyone back to AFSEA. It's good to see everyone in person again in these COVID times. So Mantech is happy uh, to support uh, Theater One for the day and, uh, and all these fantastic panelists that we were able to lock in for the day. So without further ado, Matthew Palmer will get us started for the DevSecOps Theater. Well, good morning, everyone, uh, and welcome to this breakout session on DevSecOps. Um, so the way this is going to work is that we'll first do a brief introduction of the folks up here on the panel. Um, then I have a couple of slides uh, to show that introduce two of the capabilities related to DevSecOps that this is currently working on. And then after that, we'll do some questions and answers. I have a few questions that I'll ask the panelists first um, to kind of get, get the Q&A rolling and sort of get the momentum going. And then after that, I'll turn it over to you folks in the audience. Um, but this session is, it's really about you as the attendees having the opportunity to ask questions of the government civilians at DISA who have been working to assist the department in DevSecOps. So depending on how talkative you all are, um, we will run through the remainder of our time taking questions from you all. Um, or if nobody's had their coffee yet, I have a bunch more questions to throw at the panelists. Um, but they're all easy softball questions down the middle that'll make the government look really, really good. So if you want juicy curveballs, you're gonna have to come up with those yourselves. All right then, so I will start in the introductions. I am Matt Palmer. I am the Chief Engineer for Command and Control and Modernization. Next we have, Kyle, you wanna introduce yourself? Yeah, sure. Can you guys hear me? Okay, yep. Uh, so my name is Kyle Saunders. I'm one of the government uh, civilians, uh, just the engineer side of the DevSecOps efforts uh, for the Command and Control Software Factory. I'm Drew Malloy, uh, Tech Director for the Cyber Development Directorate. And can, is it loud enough? Can everyone hear in the back and everything? Perfect. Looks like we've got about four rows of uh, people actually able to hear us. So <laughs> if I speak loud like this, can you guys hear? Is that better? Okay. All right. So if you don't want to answer questions, speak really softly. All right. <laughs> I'll put my mask back on. <laughs> Good morning. This is Will Mosini. I'm uh, serving right now as the program manager for DevSecOps in the SD division. Good morning. My name's Jason Mechanic. I'm the chief of the Cyber Standards Branch. Uh, most people know that by the the other four-letter word called a stig. <laughs> All right. So thanks, guys. And um, so as I mentioned in the opening, this is currently engaged in two efforts in the DevSecOps field. Um, the first one is what we call the CCM, or Continuous Compliance Monitoring Effort. And this is a project which is really geared towards the monitoring of containerized applications. Uh, in any software development shop in the department as they migrate builds through a DevSecOps lifestyle. Um, this is really aiming to address the cybersecurity posture of containerized apps as uh, external software PMOs advance their development methodologies through continuous integrations and de deployments, and ultimately assisting the department in getting to that ideal end state of systems having continuous ATOs. So the way in this, this is done is through something called CAC, or Compliance as Code. And this is really just a fancy way of saying that we've taken many of the STIGs that you are generally view manually at a single point in time um, before fielding applications, and we've scripted them in a way that they can be audited automatically. So in practice, what this means is a mission partner with a containerized app would be able to actually subscribe to DISA's CCM web service and their environment would be scanned and audited per the latest STIGs, which the web service would be updated continually as new STIGs are developed um, or, or new vulnerabilities found. And this can be performed in any environment and as often as a mission partner wanted, um, to the point that if it was performed frequently enough in all practical purposes, the containerized environment would be scanned at the point of continuous monitoring and hence continuous compliant with the STIGs which is a huge step towards that gold standard of a continuous authority to operate that all these applications are really seeking out. All right. So the second DevSecOps related capability that this is currently engaged in is called the C2SF or C2 Software Factory. And this capability was geared specifically to the DISA GCCS and JPEZ application portfolios at DISA and assisting them with their legacy software modernization. 
So specifically what that means is the C2 portfolios have executed new or updated software development contracts to modernize both their software and their software delivery practices. But the government did not have a really great way of um, necessarily standardizing this process for cost savings of shared investments or even necessarily having a good way to perform an audit or acceptance of non-traditional software deliveries uh, via pipelines. So we stood up this. Rather than the software PMOs all having to contract for their own DevSecOps, orchestration software, project management software, code repositories, auditing tools, or a series of low and lower environments, we put all that together in a basic admin-tenant model where the C2SF creates a shared AWS, IL-5, and IL-6 cloud infrastructure at a root level and then carves out individual tenant branches uh, for each of the software project customers. These software projects are able to inherit a series of shared software tools used in pipeline orchestration and testing, as well as retaining the ability to bring in what we call ephemeral tools or software tools specific to that project's needs uh, that they don't pull from the shared pipeline. Um, more specifically, uh, this C2SF is not a full soup to nuts, end-to-end uh, -end DevSecOps capability. This was really DISA noticing that our software development contracts were upgrading their methods and practices towards DevSecOps. Uh, but all that great automation and best practices pulled from private industry was largely occurring off-site um, in the commercial environments. And for the most part, outside of a development region ran by consultants, the rest of the software lifecycle remained in the typical linear waterfall fashion that we've had for the last couple decades. So our goal with this was really to just provide a place where that modernization could occur in a government-managed, stigged, ATO'd, CAC-enabled, mission partner, nipper and sipper capable environment. So. so that's kind of a bit of an overview of what our sort of DISA has engaged in this space to date. Um, so now on to a few questions and answers with some of our panelists. Um, so again, I'll kind of get the ball rolling and then um, after getting one or two questions each panelist, I will turn it over to you all. And depending on how many qu uh, questions you guys have, we'll run that to the end of the uh, session. Otherwise, I have some other easy softball pitches I'll give to them. All right, so first question is for uh, Mr. Malloy, uh, Technical Director for Cybersecurity and Analytics. Uh, Mr. Malloy, you were the Technical Director at the time that this initiated both of these capabilities that I just described, the C2 software factory and the container compliance effort. Um, what motivated you to particularly support these two initiatives in DevSecOps? Yeah, um, so kind of a complicated question. Uh, it was really, uh, and am I loud enough? Can everyone hear? Okay. So kind of a complicated question. We, we started down this road, I wanna say three, three and a half years ago uh, we had a, a C2 modernization effort kicking off, and that is where we started to take a look at how can we do things differently. C2 is uh, a very complex portfolio. Uh, it's managed in a very different way operationally. It's, uh, it's provisioned in a very different way. So we wanted to figure out how can we do this different. And, and looking across commercial best practices, bringing in uh, kind of the, the agile frameworks to help us with those development efforts, as well as DevSecOps. And so we really kind of started at the tactical level with C2 and, and, and building out uh, the pipeline that, that Matt just showed on the last, the last slide. And it's, it's been a progression, it's, it's, it's definitely been a journey, <clears throat> bringing that um, all the way from where we were to where we are today. So, um, so that's kind of where we started with the whole thing. Uh, then at the time, we were about six, nine months in, and uh, we're working with the DOD CIO on a number of different efforts, as well as uh, OSD, ANS. Uh, and, and they wanted to figure out how to bring the DevSecOps concepts to the DOD in general, right? And so figuring out what an enterprise DevSecOps uh, initiative would be. And, and it took us a little bit of time to figure out what that looks like, because uh, for us, it, it didn't mean here's the one pipeline, here's the one set of tools that everyone can use and this is the only thing that you can do, right? You can't go left, you can't go right. Um, we have a lot of experience in the enterprise service game here in DISA and, and telling people you have to use this uh, guarantees that at least 50% are gonna say no, right? So figuring out 
how we can add value to people who are starting their DevSecOps uh, initiatives their, themselves. <clears throat> and that really spun us off partnering with RME with what we're doing with, uh, with the STIGs uh, to figure out how do we go down the route of automation, right? How do we, how do we provide these uh, compliance as code as was referenced earlier? How do we provide, uh, uh, provide these scripts at an enterprise level that anyone can download, anyone can use to automatically secure the software applications that you're using? So that's kind of where we started with both efforts. Um, CIO, uh, you know, was able to palm for money because they saw this as uh, as a big initiative that that really needed to take hold within DevSecOps. And then we started to partner with uh, the folks at Air Force at Platform One as they started their journey, um, standing up Iron Bank, uh, and and we've partnered with them. We've contributed uh, some of what we have to them. We've pulled down some of their containers. Uh, so it's really been. Uh, it's been, you know, three and a half years. It's 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 been a while. This has not been an overnight thing, uh, but for sure we're starting to see tremendous progress, both at the tactical level, for C2, and then at the enterprise level with uh, how we provide this compliance as code mindset. All right. Awesome. Thank you, Mr. Malloy. Got some fans. Thank you. Um, Thank you. All right. This, so this one is for uh, Mr. Mechanic uh, from uh, Dissa RME. So. Much of the uh, touted benefits of DevSecOps revolves around the notion of continuous integration and delivery of code through automated pipelines and into the operational environment. Do you believe that this introduces cyber risk for the department, or does the notion of automating previously human tasks uh, from the software delivery chain, such as DBAs running command line prompts, manual patch management practices, um, actually have the potential to make our systems more secure? It sounded like there was a couple questions in there. Uh, I'll, I'll start with the, does it make the department more secure? I think there's two answers to that. Um, the pipelines themselves have to be main, maintained in a secure state uh, to uh, include all the repositories that we're going to be doing that distribution. Um, and once we start delivering that content out to the customers and, and our constituents, uh, from that point on, delivering the secure content that is based on you know, the STIGs and stuff like that um, should establish a, a well-formed baseline for people to work off of to start their level of security. Um, as Drew alluded to, even with the tool sets, there's several different avenues that people like to go with with their content uh, and how they secure things also. Um, so this is the baseline they can start from and that should help with further security. I will caution though, um, we're only as good as the sharpest tool in the shed. DISA and our team on the STIG side has been delivering things like in the old days, gold disk to SCAP compliant benchmarks. Um, one of the latest ones we're, we've been leveraging from the CIO's office that worked on some tasks with us is compliance enforcement stuff with Chef, Poppet, Ansible, those type of technologies. And now moving over to the uh, realm of the uh, compliance as code and continuous monitoring as we shift our focuses there. Um, we can hand you the tool, but if you don't read the instructions, uh, you can definitely create your own denial of service with the tool. Uh, we've had many instances of the gold disk, oh, I want the platinum option. They click it, they don't read the part where it says the platinum option will also reset all your passwords and lock you out of the system. Um, I think the monitoring aspect in compliance is code We'll still have some of those similar denial of service things, uh, self-induced, but for the larger part, the better benefit of the DOD, when used properly, uh, we should be at a better security posture. Awesome, thank you. Um, so this one is for uh, for Will. Um, Will the uh, the DIO or DOD CISO's office recently released a continuous ATO memo regarding DevSecOps and containerization. 
what does this mean for your compliance as code project? And do the compliance as code files provide the developers and system owners with a continuous ATO? Yes. <laughs> no. All right, of next question. <laughs> Please continue. No, I wish it was that simple. We all do, right? But there's not one simple answer to a continuous ATO. It's multi tiered, and the answer to obtaining uh, a CATO also has multiple facets. In the memo that was recently issued, there's, there's three tenets, and we fall specifically uh, under tenet two, which addresses continuous uh, monitoring, and um, this is really where, where we fall in uh, with our CAC files that we're producing and with our CCM work. What we offer is not the answer to a CATO. What we're working on in terms of our CAC files that we're compiling and our CCM that we're, that we're ultimately working on is really a tool to facilitate many of our stakeholders and mission partners in obtaining a CATO. And again, the, the memo that came out um, was brief, but it highlighted kind of a roadmap of requirements which someone needs to accomplish. It didn't obviously get down into the details. It's a memo. But what we offer we feel very confidently can facilitate accomplishing not just, not just certain aspects of that, but provide a solution in the future. But the short answer is, is no. We are, we're not going to, our, our option, uh, what we provide doesn't come with a CATO, unfortunately. But I think just to uh, uh, toot the disahorn, you know, most of these big level CIO memos don't actually tell you, they just tell you what you should do um, and don't tell you how. Um, and uh, so I think, you know, of the three main pillars, this is a, a much more uh, mature version of, of the how for, for one of those, um, which is, a, I think, a pretty big first uh, start towards that effort. So this one's for you, Kyle. Uh, Mr. Saunders, what other DISA or DOD portfolios outside of the C2 PMO have been interested in becoming tenants of the C2 software factory? And have you ran into any unique challenges or issues as you've considered growing the program outside of just command and control? Sure, yeah, thanks. So there's been a, there's been a lot of interest now that we've actually have a full-fledged system with the C2 portfolio, and we've been mostly able to prove ourselves to them. Um, as we've started branding out and trying to reach out to other people within DISA and specifically SD, um, the big effort's been trying to figure out um, where in a program's critical path, like from their development to production, where can we kind of blend, uh, fit in, blend, blend ourselves to kind of make the transition, um, you know, over to DevOps kind of as, e as easy as possible? Because just for us to to have an environment set up, and a, if a program just takes our environment, it doesn't mean they're truly like CI, CD, DevOps, using DevSecOps. Um, there's a lot of facets and pieces to that, like contractual pieces, development pieces, uh, security pieces, testing pieces, and then actually pushing to production. So kind of identify that those are some initial issues and it's super easy to kind of find along a program's critical path where we can kind of fit in each of our little processes at a time. Um, so to, to answer your question, there's been multiple programs and it seems that Fortify, Fortify Scan seem to be the big holdup within DISA. So that's kind of where we are now is identifying what programs have to do Fortify Scans, showing them that, hey, we can do this, this these Fortify Scans with automation. And um, yeah, that's kind of where we're going now. So, so basically, the uh, the C two software factory is not a an all or nothing. It's a it's a pretty large series of shared tools and environments yeah. that, you know, if if a program has one particular need, they could carve out and use and only pay for one small useful slice of it, um, kind of as they dip their toe into modernization without yep. you know necessarily fully adopting it all at once. Yep. So it's super super modular, uh, which is pretty awesome. You can really pick and choose whatever features you need. Uh, you know, say say you might. Say you might not need Fortify scans, you might want Sonar Cube scans that you can choose, choose to use that in the factory. So super modular, you can kind of pick and choose what you need based on your program's requirements. Thanks. Yeah, I, I would say sitting in, in my new role, um, the, the demand signal is, is pretty high. It's, it's the how do we get there, right? And Kyle, Kyle kind of touched on it, right? It's the contracts, it's, it's, it's um, the programmatics, the logistics of how we're doing it. Uh, I think what, what the C2 program is getting right for sure is that they are going after that admin tenant model to say, um, we'll give you the easy button. Because if you're a program and you're just starting out, you're going to say, well, so now I have to procure 
cloud services for my infrastructure. Okay, how do I do that? And then, and then how do I set up that contract so that it's scalable? Okay, now what tools do I need? Okay, how do I get those licenses for those tools? All right, now I need admins who know what they're doing in DevSecOps. And so all of that becomes um, very daunting, especially from a government perspective with, with a small amount of resources. Uh, and, and that's where they'll, they'll say, okay, prime, prime contractor, just you take care of it, right? It's, it's too hard. Uh, C2's um, starting to get, to get where you kind of have that easy button on the government side to where you say, we can provide all of that. We can be the admin for you. Right, you still you still have to. We still have to figure out the, the contractual piece, right? The money piece. How are we going to sustain this thing? And, and what's tough is, this is really, this was not a funded program uh, as far as bring DevSecOps to the agency. It really started more organically, and now it's more coalition of the willing people coming in. But the demand signal for sure is very high. So, uh, uh, Drew, this this next one's um, another one for for you. So. As you, as you kind of referenced, you've had a, a number of uh, senior leadership roles in the department and you've been technical director for now, two major organizations within DISA. How has your, your vision of um, the ways in which DevSecOps should be adopted by the department changed? Yeah, I think, so, it's definitely evolved, right? Um, this, this was something new for everyone and, and of course, best laid plans uh, and, and, you know, the next thing you know, you get in the thick of it and you start to say, oh, well, that, that didn't work, right? Um, you know, there, there was a number of uh, different um, programs that, that kind of started down the route uh, and were unsuccessful. And, and part of the problem is uh, the technologies are so new. Um, uh, there's a bunch of different uh, parties who are have have a, a keen interest in this that you need to branch across to work with, right? So, uh, so, so the big problem with DevSecOps when we first started is that it started on the programmatic side, right? Do developers want to develop and, uh, and automate and make things go faster? Heck yeah, they do, right? But security doesn't want you to, to like give you the keys of the kingdom, which is fair because we've done some <laughs> dumb stuff when they have, right? So. Uh, testing is, is the same. They have, they have by policy uh, mandates that they have to, have to check to make sure before you go off and, and push things into production. So, so you can't just start on the dev side. You need to really work across and, and, and not on the tools, right? The tools are pretty simple. They're, they're, there's a lot out there. But on the government side, it's, it's really kind of breaking down the silos. We in the government have been, have been excellent at siloing ourselves into specific communities of interest, right? Um, and, and it's really kind of breaking that down to where you now have a teaming structure when you're talking about DevSecOps, right? You now have security embedded with you when you're doing the development, you're ne and, they're, and they're recommending things, things for you to do. That You now have testing embedded in, in, in your DevSecOps environment. They're now the ones who are responsible for writing the automated test scripts that will be running against your code as you push it through. So, so it is, uh, it, it is, um, it has evolved a lot from a technical perspective, but uh, just from an from an organizational perspective, um, there's there's been a lot of work done, um, and there are a lot of, of interested third parties. But you can you can hear the demand signal even from the general this morning talking about DevSecOps and how do we uh, how do we get speed the mission right, and how do we develop faster, how do we support faster. Um, so so. There is motivation out there, right? For sure. At first, this was really, um, this was really more of the programs trying to push this, and now I see a lot more, you know, collaboration. When we started the enterprise DevSecOps work, we we collaborated with RME from from the start, and and um, it's been uh, it, it's definitely been eye opening, and it's been kind of a change of mindset for how we do business as, as usual. Um, but but I think we're we're making some good progress. Great, thanks, Drew. Um, second question for uh, Mr. Mechanic. Um, so DevSecOps automation technologies, um, as Drew inferred, are, are being pushed really heavily by the senior leaders throughout the department. Um, has this influenced the way in which RME looks at cyber um, standardizations, or do you feel like the, the core cyber uh, security um, best practices and tenants still apply? 
Yeah, actually, from our perspective, from the risk management side, it, it, it hasn't changed us too much on, on that aspect. Um, we've always been uh, focused on, on keeping security at the forefront, but also trying to automate and help out the, the end user community in, in solving these problems. I think where we're moving forward to, uh, Mr. Skinner even alluded to this morning, was uh, some hurdles with things like RMF and that. Um, I think a lot of our uh, current processes that we have today that are, that are already standardized um, on the, from a STIG perspective in that, that we utilize uh, are repeatable, somewhat automated. Um, we've been doing SCAP level work for several years. Uh, as we move forward, you know, with, with the DevSecOps community collaborating with Drew and some of the other ones, uh, I want to pick out a term that, that Drew uh, utilized there, and he said enterprise. Um, from the cyber standards perspective, we almost always try to view things from an enterprise level. And that doesn't necessarily always fit everybody's one-off use case models though either. So when you come to us with the, what is the cyber secure method to do this, we step back and say, what is the method that the majority can do? Um, there were a ton of tools listed on that slide earlier there. And uh, I think a lot of people lose sight in that to put guidance out for that entire list of tools from an enterprise level perspective and to standardize that guidance down to a somewhat of a base level that the, you know, the common group of people can use takes quite a bit of uh, logic and leverage at times. Um, so, you know. The other aspect that he mentioned this morning was uh, the RMF process itself. And a lot of what we have applied to us comes down through upper level policy that happens outside of the department. It happens at the federal level. Um, there's FISMA required reporting, there's auditing, et cetera, that all have to be included into these processes that, you know, when we started working with Drew and and, and his folks, I think uh, some of those lights were turned on of, oh wow, this is much deeper than what we thought we, we had to do. So unfortunately, uh, the institutionalized silliness can actually start at a much higher level. Um, we're just where the rubber meets the road and sometimes we still have to follow those rules uh, until upper layer policies can be adjusted to properly um, get us back on the right path. Well, that's a super easy process, so I'm very, um, very confident moving forward. Uh, all right, um, thanks Jason. Uh, this is another one for Will. Um, Will, many people have never heard of a, a CAC file or a compliance as code file up until I gave the very brief presentation on it. Could you explain in a little more detail what a CAC file is how they're used and um, how mission partners could find or access them. For sure. So CAC, that's what we're talking about. We all know what that means, right? Can't afford compliance. <laughs> no, no. So, um, I, I, you know, I want to give a big thanks actually to, to Drew Malloy here. He's been a, and this is not just, a, this is sincere. He's 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 been visionary uh, with, with the work that he's done in opening up us to even be here today is really, really thanks to Drew and being a liaison to have conversations to bring us to where we need to be. There's so much work that we need to do as everyone in this building, all 4,000 4, of us know. Um, and I think we're, 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 we're making strides. Regarding CAC, back, back to this exciting conversation right here. So CAC is simply us uh, codif codification of our controls. We base everything off of our sticks all the work that the, the RME team does. And as Jason alluded to, there's just so many tools out there. There's a plethora and the list is growing by the minute. And so we're, we work in, in kind of coordination as a brother or sister uh, uh, offices to take these stigs and uh, translate that or convert those into rule sets and, and scripts that can then be used by our mission partners. 
And so what the CAC profiles really are is just a step closer to what our main uh, batch of work is, which is CCM, Continuous Compliance Monitoring. There is discussions that we've been in, it's, it's not uncommon to hear this from the DID, DOD, excuse me, uh, CIO's office, that misconfiguration and also uh, lack of compliance are some of the biggest problems that they see out there. So again, kind of going back to what Drew was saying, it's not just working on development, it's pushing the security to the left more and more and more and baking that into the process at the very beginning. That's really one of the big goals that we're, they're work, we're working on within our uh, team. And the tools that we're currently developing offer that. Again, the, going back to my initial question that I was asked about the CATO, of course, nothing that we're doing is like the ticket to get a C CATO. But having obtaining scanned data at whatever frequency you want, that's pretty, that, that's pretty powerful. That's pretty awesome. And that's what's required, actually, to get the CATO. Taking the human out of the work, making things faster and more efficient, these are some of our objectives um, with our CCM work. But CAC is foundational to that. The guidance, which is what we leverage, our STIGs, our CAC, and then ultimately our CCM, which leads us down a path to integration with you know, EMAS possibly and supplying this data um, as needed. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, Will. Um, so uh, Kyle, one last one for you. Um, You've been one of the critical civilian engineers on the DISA C2 DevSecOps effort since its inception. Um, what have been some of your biggest successes in implementing DevSecOps at DISA, and what have been some of your biggest challenges? Yep, uh, thanks. So I, I think one of our biggest successes is we've actually been able to prove that uh, DevOps, DevSecOps, is very possible inside government, like changing the whole software development life cycle uh, initially didn't seem super easy, but you know, uh, the C2SF, the software factory that we've built up, um, we're using full CI, CD, full DevOps, and it's, it's been pretty awesome that we've been able to contractually, just from like a contractually standpoint, schedule standpoint, even development standpoint, we've, we're fully DevOps, which is pretty, one of our best successes. Um, and I, th I think um, so some of our, a couple of our other successes, we've actually been able to show, uh, you know, some of these command control portfolio programs that some of these tools are very easily accessible uh, with us since we have them set up, and so we've just started that that transition. Uh, I think a couple of our biggest challenges is, uh, you know, one like Drew mentioned uh, earlier, um, just from a government perspective, uh, PMO perspective, it takes a lot of, you, like you need a lot of government folks in order to do this. There's a lot of roles that, it, you know, it takes more work than just us bidding a contract out for a three-year uh, scope of something to be built and saying, okay, hey, go build this, come back with us. It takes day-to-day, -day, you know, government folks in there managing backlogs, managing work, uh, you know, government folks managing sprints. Uh, so that's been one of the biggest challenges um, for actually onboarding programs to, to do some of this DevOps stuff is getting the government folks. And also another, another challenge that we really have is when does C2SF actually become the authoritative source? Because what we're trying to do is we're trying to retroactively really fit um, DevOps into a lot of these other programs contracts, right? Not, a lot of the time we don't have a clean contract coming in and bidding as in, hey, come do this, uh, come leverage DevOps. Us as C2SF, we're coming into a program saying, hey, DevOps is, is how you guys want to move forward to save cost, time, schedule, efficiency, all that kind of stuff. But oh, you already have a schedule or you already have a contract built out. Well, how can we kind of fit in that contract? So contractually, it's been super hard and it's taken a lot of time. Um, thanks. Yeah. So the um, just because uh, the department is pushing a new initiative doesn't mean you get to uh, rewrite every single contract and refund it um, to inc incorporate that initiative. It's pretty challenging. Um, a lot of pretty much every software PMO I think in the DoD and beyond is being pressured strongly to uh, introduce all these practices like DevSecOps, and so a lot of times you're having to uh, really work with them and what what they have contractually able to accomplish um, without busting their scope um, and trying to find a best fit. So um, just as a quick time check, um, we've got about 20, 25 minutes left. So um, we also have a lot of people here. So I do want to now uh, open it up to the, uh, the uh, audience for any questions you guys might have. Um, I'll call on you first since you were brave enough to sit up front. Yeah, microphone back there. First, I'd like to uh, is this on? Yeah, it's, it's super quiet. All right, sorry. There you go. I'd like to thank you all for coming out. It's great to see everybody, um, and I really appreciate it. 
Uh, the question I have is around enterprise. I know that you're doing a lot of technical and it might be the wrong place for the question, but you're getting to the point where you're able to provide a software factory. There are, you know, platform one that we've been working with. There's a devforce.mil, devforce.dissa.mil that a lot of your customers are at. Um, and then there was forge.mil that's no longer around. Um, trying to understand how the enterprise activity is taking place maybe in different parts of DISA so that you can take all the great work that you've done and then gain the value of you know, optimizing that over the, the discussion that just took place with getting the benefit of you know, the licensing at a lower cost, et cetera. So does anyone want to take that and then I'll be the default if it's silence? Uh, I, so I could take it. So uh, yes, a um, lot of different capabilities. DevForce is, um, and, and a lot of those, what you're seeing is, uh, by nature of the fact that we didn't start this uh, journey by saying everyone, like, this is what we're doing, right? Everyone do the same thing, this is what we're doing. Uh, a lot of this grew out of the programs themselves. I know DevForce grew out of, uh, of one of the programs specifically within DISA. Uh, in ID, not not within SD, uh, and that that started as a contractor-owned site, and, and and it was contractor managed for a very long time until uh, you know the government finally took over admin of it. But um, but that uh, so a lot of this started, like I said, we started three and a half years ago. Platform one wasn't even a thing yet, um, so the Air Force were were going down their road, we were going down ours, uh, and there was no. Uh, coordinated funding model to say, you know, everyone, you know, here's a whole pot of money to do this one thing and we're gonna have a program manager who does, just does DevSecOps, right? And so it's, it's, it's kind of been, uh, I know, you know, sayings overused, but a coalition of the willing of folks who, who are really coming together in, in a loose governance process um, just to coordinate, uh, make sure that we aren't diverting too much uh, from each other. Uh, we've we've worked with Platform One from the start. Um, you know, we still we still work with Platform with the folks at Platform One uh, and Iron Bank for uh, for what they're doing. At some point in time, uh, the department might make the decision that hey, everyone, there is a standard or there is a platform that we should coalesce around, and here is the incentive to move to that platform. It just hasn't happened yet. So so that's why you see that there's uh, DevSecOps is not. Um, is not something that is is solely a DISA thing or an Air Force thing, or that if you look across the DOD, you have tactical implementations of DevSecOps pipelines all over the place. Um, so, so how do we manage that, and how do we how do we manage it in a way that it's not so tightly controlled that we just restrict so much, right? We say you can only do this when a lot of the tools that that, that you saw within the C2IL. A lot of those tools are technology dependent, they're platform dependent, and, and things like that. They aren't all going to work work the same. So, so how do we still give you leeway to develop in the way you want to develop while also um, managing that in a better way? And the department, the department itself doesn't have a great answer for that. Um, Forge.mil was something that we were doing on the configuration management side, um, and and that fell victim to the the enterprise service death spiral of um, people pulled out and said, I don't want to pay for it anymore. So the cost became more for the people who were there. So the people who were there were like, I don't want to pay for, uh, more. So I'm pulling out. And so it just, it, it just kind of spiraled. We have to fix that problem. We have to fix that um, to get away from uh, how, we f how we fund things from, uh, from a reimbursable to, to looking at the department itself um, as to what the enterprise tools are going to be. And we've, we've made some headway in, in some areas, but DevSecOps uh, is one that, that we're continuing to work on. Thanks, and um, you know, when you have a big, big enterprise uh, department-wide contracts, those are, those are never uh, risky or controversial. They always go super smoothly <laughs> yep. um, without, yeah. without any protest or anything, so. Yes. <laughs> but, uh, and, I, and I will say, just having worked on um, our, our software factory, um, communication has been key. Uh, we talked to a lot of mission partners, even just sort of uh, ones who are theoretically interested, uh, ones that have gone to platform one, had success, ones that have gone to platform one, not had success. 
uh, ones we've pushed to platform one just because their use case sounded like it might be a bit of a better fit to them. Um, so, um, but then we, we, we do have um, a few uh, shared staff with them as well, so we always kind of know what they're doing and they know what we're doing and we make sure that um, we're all following the same reference architecture and if um, the, uh, the great hand of the department um, you know, combines us someday, um, we're um, pretty ready to sort of move all of our tenants in fairly seamlessly. Uh, next question, anybody? Sir. All right. I definitely want to thank you all for the presentation today. There's a lot of good information from this. I was also having some flashbacks to references to Forge.mil because I was attached to that program while it was in its death spiral and just doing the best to keep it functional until that final day hit. Um, this question's kind of uh, narrow in focus. It's with regards to uh, the automation plans with uh, CAC and translating the STIGs into rule sets and, uh, and scripts. One of the things previous, under previous automation tools that were available, um, like SCAP, was uh, it could do all the technical checks, stick checks. Has there been any changes or, or ways of incorporating the uh, manual administrative stigs into this process? Bill, do you want to take that one or first or Jason? I'll go ahead and uh, at least cover it from the stake perspective. So I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, that was in one of my thoughts afterwards, but automation does not mean that we can do it to 100%. Um, a lot of the uh, advertisements and that uh, you'll probably find from quite a few vendors in this facility won't give you the actual percentages of how much they do and don't do. Um, and there's, there's several reasons for that. One, some of it's just policy, uh, simple questions. SCAP has created a, uh, a schema for handling that mechanism. It's called OCIL, O C I L, um, which is uh, just an XML based mechanism to, pro to provide an end user uh, a set of questions or, or interview type things that, that you can feed it through automatic XML ingestion, which keeps it kind of standards-based. Um, the other part of non-automation comes into uh, a little bit of the risk factor that we were addressing earlier. Um, there are certain types of checks that you never want to automate, and we've learned it this way. Uh, a good example is let's ping the domain controller from 40,000 workstations to check all the user's permissions. And I guarantee you, you'll take that domain controller down real fast. And so there's those types of checks that you'll never want to do. And sometimes there'll be a developer that isn't aware of that. He's just given a requirement from a STIG you know, it could be somebody from Pete's team or, you know, Kyle. They don't know any better. And they code it. And it gets tested in a lab, which isn't a real mimic of the world. And it's not until it hits the real world that somebody calls you up and says, yeah, we got a problem with this check. It just took down our entire system. So those are what I call intrusive never code again checks. We have had those on my side with SCAP. I would imagine DevSecOps will also run into those types of scenarios. But being that they've partnered with us, we can forewarn them on those types of checks. Um, there was one other reason, I can't remember what the last one was, audits. <clears throat> there are types of checks such as auditing that are performance sucking checks. And I'll, I'll be the first to admit it, it's, it's driven by our stigs. Um, 
if you go down through the list of audit controls that are required by any system that get into the system call kernel level capability, those audit level checks on an Oracle database that handles time sensitive information will literally break the system. And those are also checks that we try to step back when we brief our management and say, although they tell us we have to do this, we're actually advising do not do this because of performance capability problems. A lot of those types of scenarios, though, come into DISA on one-off scenarios. And they usually come in through our executive management. And he comes down and says, what's going on here, folks? And because those are one-off scenarios, we don't necessarily write them into our requirements or code around them either. Um, that's something else to remember. Just because your one-off use case seems important to you, we have to evaluate what's important to the general community. So that's another aspect uh, in the coding aspect also. Um, the only answer I can say from you know, my perspective uh, on the risk management side is the OSIL is the mechanism for, from the SCAT perspective. I'm not sure on the DevSecOps side which, which route you know, will possibly you know, go on, on that aspect. I think uh, some of the local, more recent media on platform one bringing up reciprocity um, scenarios and how do we share information across uh, platforms also needs to bring into that same idea of well, what about all the scenarios that we can't automate also. So that level of information, I think moving forward, um, I see maybe that's where we, we start to improve upon uh, the products that we're delivering. Instead of just an app store that's out there where you go and get your compliance as code, maybe we provide some documentation with artifacts to say, here's the pieces I have covered, here's the pieces I don't have covered, and that's what also you're gonna have to be responsible for figuring out on your end. Thanks, Noah, that's a, that's a good point. Will, did you wanna add anything? Patrick, so that was a great question, sir, and I just want to second everything Jason said. I, I will just add this, too, as well, too. Obviously, our focus right now with, the, with the CAC files that we're coming up with and the whole effort of a CCM is obviously containerized application-based, right? So we're staying within our wheelhouse, so to speak, and we're not, we're not leaving that. Additionally, what we seek to do as well is before we send anything out there, that is the CAC files that we're publishing on cyber.mil, uh, um, uh, we are checking what we've published before, uh, but prior to publishing and releasing, we're checking what we've compiled, right? We're eating our own dog food. But also too, and, and you know, <laughs> easy words, want to invite everyone here as well too, because I'm, I'm sure I'm gonna forget, but we actually have a, a booth set up with our CCM demo where you can actually see kind of those words in action with what we talked about. Our partners here from Mantech have a booth right next to uh, Google. You'll see the big circular thing that says, Google and Mantech, but we have our demo right there, and we welcome all of you all to stop by, check the demo, I promise you it's just gonna be a couple minutes, and a ask additional questions there as well. I wanna get that out there, thank you. And, and I think too, like most of us uh, on the panel are, are, have been at this a while, and we're pretty practical, so despite what the, uh, the graphics say, where it's like rocket mortgage, and you press a button, you get your ATO, I think uh, most of us are, are really just motivated to, you know, there's, there's still, not everything is gonna ever be automated 100% likely, um, but there's still, I don't think there's a, a software program in the department that doesn't have quite a bit of runway they could uh, automate safely. And I think we're just trying to get at what sort of that sweet spot is as quickly as possible with the tools as the policies are coming out. Anybody else have questions? Let's start over here, gentlemen, the, the black mask. So I wanted to start with just an admin question. Your slides say FOUO. Uh, I saw a lot of people taking pictures of them. Do you want to clarify they're, that they're, they're not? not FOUO? They're not. Okay. Um, this was, yeah, they're they're not FOUO. That was in the template. Okay. All right. So you guys are fine. Um, uh, so so I guess my concern is um, we've kind of done a lot of this stuff in our software development efforts, um, but 
my, my question is how much has this been coordinated with the, uh, the AO's office and the SCA R chain? Um, our, our experience is that they don't deal with the concept of risk management, right? We, we have to take our findings, we run Fortify, and we have to, any open finding, whether it's a false positive or a risk we have to accept because we built on top of a commercial tool or something, that has to be completely hidden from them because they can't accept any open risk at all. And in our production system, when we hooked up to CMRS and fed in like the IAVM scan data and things like that, uh, we turned on continuous monitoring and the first time they showed an open IAVM finding, they said, we're going to stop your ATO process, go back and start over again because you can't have any open findings, you can't show any risk in the process at all. And um, it, it seems like, you know, if you're going to run this stuff on development systems that aren't locked down for production, and you want to say, well, this new batch of code didn't make it any worse, right? It didn't add any new findings, didn't, didn't add, you know, didn't bring in another software thing that, um, you know, maybe isn't patched to the latest version, that our, our AO chain would have to be willing to, to look at this data and see that um, you know, it's going to be normal to have open findings and it's more important to believe that your process, you know, those findings will be closed in production and this new code didn't make anything any worse. Is, is, is there some kind of belief that they're going to buy off on that concept and, and let you get these ATOs? Yeah, I, I could take it. And Jason, so, so Jason works on the SIG side, the secure configuration management. There's also part of RME that that, that does the accreditation piece, right? So, um, and, and so it's a process, right? It's it's a complete change in the way that they're doing business. Uh, they've started to embrace this, especially at the leadership level. It's just then figuring out how that trickles down to the AO level, uh, and, and what does that look like? And like I said before, how do we still keep the proper checks and balances? Jason gave a great example of automating things that we really shouldn't be automating. Like, you know, I said before, if, if we get out ahead of security, we can tend to do some dumb stuff, right? Um, and taking down your demand controller is really dumb. That's, that'll be a very bad day for you, right? So, um, so figuring out uh, with RME in conjunction what that, what right looks like and getting away from just uh, the pure um, kind of checklist mentality that we had before is is going to take some time, but but some of these automated tools, some of these automated scans can help. And if we can baseline something like like kind of what you talked about earlier, if we can baseline something to say these we run these scans, we have these findings, they're not applicable because of this. The next time you run those automated scans and those things come up, then we already have those quarantined to say hey. These are, these are vulnerabilities that we already know are in the system, right? And or they're poemed and or um, they're not applicable, right? And so, uh, so we can start to, to shorten that, those timelines. And, and, you know, like Matt said, you're never, we're never going to get to continuous ATO, right? Not, not, not in the way people are thinking of like, hey, perfect, we're good. No, no humans in the loop, uh, and, and we're completely secure. We're not really going to get there. But if we can shorten the amount of time it takes for security and testing, even 50%, and you extrapolate that over the entire Department of Defense, that is a huge cost savings, and has a huge time savings, right? And so those are the types of things that we're, um, we're working towards. And I, and I understand, Joe, like, um, it's, you still have folks who are in the, in the mentality of, this is RMF, this is my job, is to make sure that all of this, uh, you know, all of this stuff is, is being checked. But we have to, we have to work with, with RME and across the agency, with our testing community, even up at leadership levels to make sure that they're on board as we're moving, moving forward with this. Okay, so, so it kind of sounds like that's work that needs to be done. Because, I mean, if, if we could follow that same process, because we're, you know, in the process now of trying to find ways to hide all that stuff so that the AO doesn't get hung up on the fact that, well, we had an application, we put it on a, you know, a container or an endpoint, we scanned it before, we installed the application, we scanned it again, nothing changed, there were no open, new findings, but the box itself had some findings, so they rejected it because we put it on a box that wasn't 100% patched or something, right? It's like, well, that wasn't what we were trying to measure, so we had to go back to our testers and say, don't give them the, the actual scans, right? Give us a document that says, hey, 
we baselined this thing before we installed software, we scanned it again, the baseline didn't change, there were no new findings as a function of the software. The software doesn't have any ACAS related stuff. And we're basically having to do the same thing with Fortify, that, you know, that, that chain just is not ready to deal with the fact that, you know, and particularly if you're gonna do it in a development environment where it's not fully locked down for production, that when you run the scans, you're gonna see open findings mm -hmm. and that's expected and it doesn't necessarily indicate that your final security posture is gonna be unacceptable. Right. So if, if you guys can you know, kind of <laughs> increase those skids for us and you know, tell us what that process looks like and who you've educated on how to deal with uncertainty and risk management versus risk avoidance, um, I think that would be awesome. Thank you. Kyle's got that. <laughs> Joe, just stop by the booth, brother. I got, I got the solution for you. <laughs> Every answer at the demo. All right, um, any other questions? We're running a little low on time, um, but I want to make sure that people had, still had a chance if we had to stay a few minutes over. Sir. Actually, Joe asked my in initial question, but I do have a new question. Um, so Matthew, you showed a, a, a slide with a palette of commercial tools. Um, I think a lot of those tools are applicable not just for DevSecOps where the product you're testing is code, but maybe for um, commercial shrink wrap products. Is there any appetite to try to encourage commercial vendors offering uh, the DOD shrink wrap tools a way of maybe moving their development to your platform, therefore getting easier, faster path to, to ATO and getting things staked a lot faster. I know that the, the, the default answer, I, I've, I've heard, oh, uh, just go to platform one. Will you be able to give a more, I would say, flexible alternative to, to commercial vendors to encourage them to, you know, just offer code uh, to be developed on your platform? Yeah, so I, I can I can briefly start with this one. So um, ideally, yes, um, you know at least in the some of the software contracts that this has been writing lately um, since we've had this, we've actually included the tool set and the environment and things like that in the in the in the PWS and the work statements and things like that. So they're aware of the tools we use, and they can sort of bid accordingly and in either um, use our environment or or you know stand up their their own to, to match it. Um, I think part of it is just you know. The piece we were really trying to address initially was that, you know, most most of the software contracts have the development written into the contract occur at the consultant site. Um, that that's that's just pretty standard the way it's been done for a long time. There's not a lot of government ran managed development environments where you're just buying people and they 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 show up and work. Um, so we were kind of dealing with that model mm -hmm. um, initially, and that's where most uh, software PMOs are at. So when when we were kind of figuring out, okay, well, which part of the DevSecOps do we take on, given that it's you know. We only have enough time and scope and money to, to, to um, you know, do part of the part of it. We sort of chose the middle part where most software PMOs had their own development regions. They had their own developers. They, you know, they had their own, you know, Azure or AWS cloud where they were writing software. Um, hope, you know, hopefully they were developing pipelines and things like that and automation using a lot of the same tools. Mm -hmm. um, and we really just wanted a version of that that was running in a government managed environment that they could sort of pre-flight that stuff on to see how it would work. Um, and then some feedback mechanism to developers, you know, relatively quickly so that they could, you know, make adjustments and, and sort of perform that cycle. Um, really what was, what was lacking was the fact that, you know, these, all these modernized tools that the consultants had weren't in an environment that was STIG, ATO, peered with Nipper and Sipper and all these things. And so nobody really knew exactly what would work and what would get kicked back. And then, it, you know, then you're back to sort of the linear process of software development onward. So that was really sort of the best bang for the buck that we wanted. And then, you know, if this grows legs, we, you know, we're kind of looking at, okay, the next do, and then, then do we just take on the development piece? Um, so that develop, they're developing from scratch directly in there, but, um, you know, we've, we've kind of thought about that, and ideal, you know, ideally that would be sort of the next main um, node of the DevSecOps process we take on. It's just, we can't as a third-party product, you know, enforce every PMO to do that. It kind of takes a lot of, coordination across how PMOs are rewriting their software modernization contracts. Um, 
you know, to, so that they're writing them in such a way that, that the developers that they award to could actually develop in that manner. Good to know. Thank you. No problem. I can still stay. We are three minutes over. Um, so, but if anyone else has questions, um, raise your hand or come up to the mic or uh, filter out to lunch, whatever you guys want. All right. I guess that's it. Thank you.